So I've been following an a ongoing scandal in the Shakespeare world uh, this week. Michelle Terry at The Globe has cast herself. She's the artistic director at The Globe. She's cast herself as Richard III, attracting a lot of backlash and criticism from actors with disabilities who have accused her of cripping up or using a crip face. In other words, pretending to have a disability when she doesn't. The headline quote from one of these actors, Matt Fraser, is I'm done with pretenders, which seems like quite an odd thing for an actor to say. What interests me about this whole debate is that the rift seems to go beyond identity politics and representation to an argument about fundamentally what acting is, whether or not it's real or pretending. So we've got actors like Fraser calling for a total moratorium on pretending. And he's not alone. Joshua J. Parker has said that Richard III is a play about disability. There is an air of authenticity within that part that cannot be learned. A, a breathtakingly uh, conceited thing to say, even for an actor, that, uh, that the part cannot be learned. No one has ever been able to learn how to play Richard III. You're, it's something you're born into. Then there is the uh, Disabled Artists Alliance, which has said that Richard III cannot be successfully performed with a non-disabled actor. And out with the bathwater of that quote go the performances of Laurence Olivier, Anthony Cher, Catherine Hunter. Nope, rubbish didn't happen. Don't count. Those cannot have been in any way successful. Uh, Robert Softly Gale adds uh, this dribble of warm air, saying that acting is not about pretending, it's about being and authenticity. No, acting is pretending. Um, even if we look at some of the uh, listed actors who have disabilities who have recently played Richard III, one of them whose name checked is Kate Mulvaney, who has a uh, curved spine like the historical uh, Richard III. But uh, she still had to pretend that she was a man, like the historical Richard III. Um, and many of the other actors listed that have disabilities have completely different disabilities to um, Richard himself. Um, there are actors who are blind, actors who have different physical uh, impairments. All those actors still have to pretend a little beyond their own lived experience. The overall gist of the complaints made by the contributors or the, uh, the people quoted in the article, which I'll, I'll link below, was that this was a huge step back for um, theatre makers and actors with disabilities. One of the contributors, Joshua J. Parker, explained his disappointment by saying, we're trying to be brave and put out groundbreaking storytelling by casting people with disabilities in the part of Richard III, as opposed to um, how the Globe are doing it. Um, I'd question how groundbreaking you can be if you've decided in advance not to learn anything, not to build on uh, previous performances and, and not to uh, think about the part beyond casting. Throughout the article, this is described as uh, practitioners reclaiming Richard III, but it's not really much of a reclamation if it's, if it's all about authenticity to the actor. Um, it's not really about reclaiming Richard III as proclaiming yourself. Um, the groundbreaking part of the story you're telling is you, it's your story. Uh, the audience are going to sit there and they are, they are meant to think how groundbreaking, how brave when you walk on. This is an attitude which puts the actor before the parts. Personally, I like it when actors disappear into parts, not when parts vanish into actors. Maybe a Richard III who is exhausted by his overabundance of virtue would be an interesting way to go, but... Uh, maybe it would just restate a falsehood about disability and morality the other way around. Uh, in Shakespeare's day and in Shakespeare's play, it is called into question whether or not uh, Richard III's disability, his deformity, as he calls it, is linked to his morals, if it informs his moral character, as was uh, believed as a superstition in Shakespeare's time and before. Obviously, modern audiences would criticise such an attitude in real life, although we do still see it. Um, in pop culture all the time. How many times have you seen a Bond villain with a facial injury? Uh, the, the implicit message being by lots of lazy recycling of villains that there is some kind of link between evil and a facial wound. People are rightly pissed off about that because it's, uh, it's a falsehood. A facial injury has no bearing whatsoever on um, someone's morality, good or bad. It's morally neutral, like any other kind of um, disfigurement or disability or illness. Richard III is no more defined by his disability than anyone living with disabilities are by theirs. Um, but I want to end on um, a quote from another theatre maker called Sam Brewer. He says that there's this idea that anyone should be able to play any part. Um, I'm paraphrasing here, but he talks 
in terms that uh, will be familiar to anyone who's seen this conversation play out in terms of identity politics and and uh, representation and casting that the pendulum needs to swim swing back the other way he expresses a frustration with the um quid pro quo attitude towards casting well well it should just be as open as anyone so how can you get annoyed when uh you know a, a straight actor is is once again cast as a as a gay character or a white actor is once again uh, cast as a as a character from pop culture or history who is a person of color um that happens all the time and uh personally i i i sympathize um hugely with this idea of you know waiting for the pendulum to swim swing back the other way it's all very well going okay we've realized we should probably do representation so from now on we're going to split it totally fairly maybe maybe there should be a little bit of uh, of of give and take to make up for um how things have historically gone i think this really succinctly addresses the difficulty of these conversations because it immediately puts into words the conflict between a an artistic ideal and um practicalities the artistic ideal being anyone should be able to play any part i personally think that's a good ideal Re- regardless of your um whatever disabilities you're living with regardless of your ethnicity regardless of who you like to sleep with um you should be able to play any part the act of representation is infinitely flexible it can accommodate any different take in my opinion but that's a nice ideal to have which has n- has little bearing on reality in which as as brewer says the pendulum needs to swim swing back the other way i understand where where the the frustration comes from and it doesn't help that michelle terry is casting herself in uh, in richard the third at the globe as the artistic director of the globe but i think you can't put a moratorium on actors without disabilities playing richard the third the part is not just a historic person but shakespeare's creation and i'm afraid i disagree with joshua j parker when he says it's a play about disability depending in whose hands it is it could be a play about any number of things and i don't necessarily think that you know richard's disability needs to be portrayed literally in every adaptation personally i'd like in in debates of this kind to see the the conversation move further away from uh centering on characters on fake people I know Richard the 3rd was a real person but we're talking about Shakespeare's Richard the 3rd an abstract and more into real roles for real people in the arts. Uh every time it comes around whether it's Anne Boleyn or you know some kind of reddity quid pro quo which you can see the conversation just circling the drain until someone says well what next Jason Statham as Nelson Mandela or some crap like that. Instead of fixating on on parts I think we should concentrate more on roles within the arts, how to make them accessible and how to fill them fairly.